I decided to, to do a book about the integrated spring mass model, which is a model of how the body moves, how it absorbs impacts, how it recycles energy, and how it um, opens up spaces for the safe passage of blood vessels and nerves, and your joints, the engineering of it. And how uh, we as doctors look at the body for years, we thought we were being really sophisticated and advanced by looking at the body as a lever mechanism, and it was a, it was a, a kinematic chain. And um, we couldn't figure, I couldn't figure out, I had thoracic outlet syndrome from a real bad injury in sports. I went head first into the ground and I broke three ribs in my back and my shoulder was constantly in pain. And I was a chiropractor. Uh, I was actually in chiropractic college surrounded by a thousand chiropractic students and teachers and they couldn't diagnose me properly. And then my father was a chiropractor. You know, we goes back 65 years in Chicago, our family. And my dad would give me a first rib adjustment, but never put the diagnosis thoracic outlet syndrome. And my dad didn't do a lot of deep tissue. You know, he was some old time chiropractor. Whenever I worked with my father, and if somebody came with a shoulder problem, it was mostly muscular, say, my son will take care of you. And he would pass them on to me. As a chiropractor, I would see 20 patients with a shoulder problem and six cases with low back pain or neck pain. So shoulder and neck pain became my specialty because I had suffered for so long with this thoracic outlet syndrome. I got involved in a car accident about four years after I had that, that rugby injury. And, uh, and I looked in the rear view mirror and I saw this, this car coming at me and I'm thinking to, to my friend, I said, hold on tight because he's not gonna stop. And sure enough, bam, he hit us from the behind and people flew through the windshield and it was a horrible accident. And I felt good because I didn't go through the windshield and I didn't have to be carted off in the ambulance, but I wasn't really feeling good, you know? And I suffered for, for years with that pain. And then I took 27 credits my first year in the summer at chiropractic college with laboratories, and was that ever a mistake? Um, sure, I got out two years earlier and I was a doctor at age 24, but not without the, the, you know, the consequences of the chronic pain. And so as a doctor, I'm treating people with chronic pain when I had chronic pain, you know? And I said, what is going on? You know, like I had almost given up on, you know, natural cures for chronic pain. And, and I, I was like, what am I have to live with this for the rest of my life? I almost started taking painkillers. And if you're a chiropractor, like, that's like, the, that's like something you would never do. That is a, that is a sign of failure. And, and I would just, that failure doesn't work real well with me. I'm not really good with failure. So I worked diligently for years to try to figure out what went wrong because I went to so many experts and I didn't get better. So it was not only happening with me, it had to happen with a lot of other people. And if I knew how to like figure this out, I knew I would be able to help a lot more people with thoracic outlet syndrome and other compressive disorders. So that's what, how I came up with the integrated spring mass model. And in Malaysia, I did a talk in 2014 after I had read about 50,000 pages of research to pr prove up the spring mass model that uh, the lecture was how to improve human performance by reduction of overmodulation or control of tension on the integrated spring mass system. And the doctors looked at this crazy lecture I had and then when I got done, I use I didn't use like research from I did use research though from uh, certain points like some Japanese research on Japan about how we put diagnostic ultrasound on the calf and how the the calf muscle came to one length when we transitioned the weight across the limb and then it stayed that length throughout the entire time we transitioned the weight across the limb which proves that walking and running is actually through elastic elements and not by pushing the body forward like we think with lever systems. So I use that research, but most of the way I proved up, up the integrated spring mass model was through physics and engineering, Hooke's model of physics. And because it was proven with physics, the doctors were sitting there looking at me, trying to tell me somehow how the inverted pendulum model and the lever system model was actually the way it should be. And then I came and I, I, I just like erased 
or I refuted everything that they had learned over 340 years with this new spring mass model. And they, I could see in their faces that they were like, how did you just do that? You know, and then several doctors with fellows that I met who became lifelong friends since then said, this really seems like a breakthrough. And that's when I was received the honorary degree from the King the following year for that research. Now, what I'm gonna talk about is thoracic outlet syndrome because you wanna know something? Thoracic outlet syndrome conservatively is not treated right. And it's not, there's not only, it's, it's misdiagnosed, it's mistreated, um, it, it's undertreated. Uh, it, it, the problem is there's a lot of problems with uh, medicine. And one of them is there's a business plan. And the second one is there's a treatment plan. And when doctors get more focused on the business plan, the treatment plan suffers. Like let's say a patient has like three units of uh, uh, 97140, which is deep tissue or manual therapy on their insurance, and they have a thoracic outlet syndrome. 45 minutes, you cannot get to do deep tissue on one side of the body for thoracic outlet syndrome. It takes about an hour and a half to two hours to meticulously go through every single fiber of muscle to release the thoracic outlet. So the problems are that surgery is done in patients that don't need surgery, you understand? Because they're undertreated. And they say, well, we've done everything we can. Well, I'm not really making a lot of progress. Well, let's go back to the orthopedic doctor. Let's go back to the vascular surgeons, have a chat, and let's do some more injections, some studies. Uh, looks like we're gonna have to go in there and gonna have to cut those scalenes out, and remove that first rib. Okay, so these are the reasons for why we do surgery on thoracic outlet syndrome. I can't take the pain, intractable pain. I can't take it anymore. So doctor, could you please cut the pain out of my body? Patients think that, you know, they say, well, if I get the surgery, I'll have less pain or I'll be pain free. When even Doctors who do thoracic outlet syndrome surgery, and they do it every day, they know they can't get rid of the pain completely with the patient. Um, the studies show that maybe 2%, 3%, 10%, 15% of the patients are pain-free or mostly pain-free after the surgery. 20% good, plus or minus, that means that they have symptoms still, not the major ones. Maybe they're arm is not swollen because the, the pressure not on the subclavian vein or their hand is not cold. They don't have the blood clot anymore. They, you know, they have had that, um, uh, the blood clot, they put the catheter in, get the clot busters out, and that took them away from the risk of a pulmonary emboli and a, a pulmonary infarct, but um, they're still in pain. Okay, so long-term compression means that they've had it for so long, and nothing is changing, so let's just try something. Let's try surgery. Uh, neurologic deficit, this one I completely disagree with, that NTOS, which is neurologic thoracic outlet syndrome, that's when the uh, first rib hits the uh, for, uh, first thoracic nerve in uh, seventh cervical, and uh, they have numbness in their hands. People do surgery for that. Um, I, I just think that that is not an indication for surgery. Period. Arterial compression, um, cold hands, they, their hands are cold, they can't get the blood flow in the, in the hands, the arms. Yes, that's something to consider. Complete and unsuccessful initial treatment of subclavian vein thrombosis. So what they did was they put the clot busters in, they removed the clot from the vein, and then they say, well, we have to do a decompression. That means that they're gonna surgically remove the first rib, the floor of the outlet, and the scalene muscles that lift it up, okay? The problem is there's a floor of the outlet that is lifted up by the scalene muscles here, and the roof of the outlet can drop down from weakness in the trapezius muscles, from the contracting too much, and also from the muscles in the shoulder pulling the roof down into the outlet, compressing the outlet as well as pulling on the neck as well. So that is something that is mis- uh, misunderstood and um, overlooked. If they have a previous surgery from thoracic outlet syndrome and they do a second surgery, uh, a revision, like let's say that the doctor didn't cut off enough of the rib or their scar tissue or the artery, or there's got to be some um, 
uh, vessel reconstruction, a stent or something like that. That's where they do surgery as well. And sometimes I think surgery is performed for the wrong reason. Uh, one doctor said, well, you know, they have good insurance, they have their escalate syndrome. And you know what, the doctor got a kick out of giving the rib to the patient after the surgery and they wear it around their neck when they're surfing. So, um, you know, I mean, this is uh, people's lives here and this is not um, something that we should be uh, looking at as a hobby. It's something that's very serious and could affect their lives. Now, some of the, um, this is a patient that came to me who was a nurse and chose to the healthcare field, okay? This is the study, okay? The patient was driving down the highway. She slowed down to about 15 miles an hour to get off the ramp. She turned her body and head to look to the right, and then the vehicle behind her struck her from behind. So she was looking to the right, and then she got hit from behind. Neck stretching on the left, scalenes on the left, first rib, uh, first rib was elevated on the left. But we're gonna go through it. This is what happened to her. She had severe chest pain and difficulty breathing. Chest pain comes from the, the, the first, the ribs. When, when she was hit, the ribs were, imagine like your rib cage is like a cage, like a bird cage, and you hit it with a sledgehammer. How are you gonna like uh, reposition all those ribs and then get them moving again properly without doing muscle treatment to the intercostal muscles? All of them, oh my God, daunting, daunting. And then readjust all those ribs and get them moving, keep the scar tissue from forming. Plus you have all these muscles that attach to the ribs. The first and second, they're the scalene muscles attached to the first and second rib, okay? The pec minor attached to the third, fourth, and fifth rib. So those are the muscles that, that, that they find in thoracic outlet syndrome, which are being surgically resected. These are the ones that cause the pain up in here, first and second rib from the scalenes, and then between the shoulder blades is the pain in the pectoralis muscles here. These muscles can actually pull these ribs out of alignment, twist the rib cage up into a chronic state of suffering because they're powerful muscles. The muscles in the back are more like drapes or like they, they, they fan out and they can't individually pull ribs out of alignment. Yet chiropractors will manipulate the ribs from a prone position, click, 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 and they forget that the ribs are being pulled out of alignment by splinting of the muscles in the front, you see? Now, if I got a patient with pain between the shoulder blades, I know to go to the pectoralis minor muscle and lay the patient on their side and work on the pectoralis minor, minor muscle from the, in, from, from the side, and so that's where we have a problem. Now, severe pain in the neck and on face on the left. So she's looking to the right, she gets hit from behind, and the neck is torqued and, uh, strained and the muscles are pulled and injured and inflamed. So she has extreme headaches that start at the base of her skull and the left jaw area radiating into the face and the neck. So she's got pain shooting across the neck through here and, and, and also in the base of the skull and it's shooting into the face, okay? She has severe left shoulder pain and, um, and it, the pain is in the armpit, like here. Okay, that's exactly where we, where the doctors will go in up to remove the first rib through the transaxillary method. And also the armpit is where the um, pectoralis minor muscle is found. And also with the latissimus dorsi attaches in that area. So motor, this motor vehicle accident was what caused the pain. This is the most common cause of neck pain and thoracic outlet syndrome. This is what the patient presented with this pain. And she went to the emergency room, they ordered a chest x-ray, which was negative for broken bones or dislocated, dislocations. You know what, when I put a chest x-ray up, I look at the distance between the ribs on the right and the ribs on the left. And I wanna check to see if there's any shifting of the ribs besides broken bones and also dislocated bones, or broken ribs I had but you can have a, a pretty good twisting of the rib cage without having broken bones. The hospital ordered EKG, which was negative because she had chest pain, they thought it was a heart condition, and also the diagnosis was that she had a chest wall contusion 
but in reality, she had massive subluxation of the rib cage. Missil, uh, you know, subluxation is not a luxation, but it's a it's partially um, shifted. It's shifted. All right, this is an MRI scan that they did. They ordered an MRI of the a neck, and the results came back as she had a degree of spinal stenosis of the neck. Now, you know, the 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 the, the width of the of the spinal cord area. You know, this, whether it's narrow or not, that is is really, in my, in my opinion, is somewhat um, subjective. And like, one doctor would say there's stenosis, one doctor would say there isn't. But we all know stenosis takes years. Well, this patient had pain right after an accident. That's not an important finding. It's important finding, okay, we make note of it, but it's not part of her condition that she reported to, and it's not really the cause of her pain. Stenosis does not cause pain. The narrowing causes, um, uh, can cause uh, 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 uncoordinated movements because of spinal cord compression. The other results showed a syringeal myelia at T7 to L1. The, the condition is up here in the neck area. T7 to L1 is in, in, in the transitional area between the thoracic and the lumbar spine. So it's not even part of the problem, and she knew it, she's a nurse. So she was prescribed hydrocodone, some painkillers, and Motrin and Fioriset, okay? Now, she was only able to, she works in, uh, with children with um, special needs as a nurse, and so she's lifting them and loving them, and she's no longer able to do that uh, because she is limited to only 35 pounds and she has problems even at that point. Now she's developing tingling in the fourth and fifth digits, which means that what's really happening is that on the left-hand side, the, the, the first rib is rising up into the thoracic outlet, into the tunnel, and it's clipping off the first nerve at the base, which is the uh, T1, and it's starting to cause a tingling in these two fingers. Now, I had a patient that came to me, actually, I, was work, I work in the entertainment industry, and I was working for Steely Dan, so a, a famous jazz group, and the bass player said he was out with this piano player from Smokey Robinson's band, and he said he couldn't pick up the, the top of the miso soup because his hand was like uh, weak and he couldn't get grip strength to just take this little plastic top off the soup. And he said, you have to see this doctor we have on backstage and he will help you. So he came to me and I said, now tell me what's going on. He said. Well, five years ago, I was diagnosed with diabetic neuropathy. And my hand, it just, I get, it's numb and I have no grip strength on both sides. And well, tell me how it progressed. He says, well, it went here to the fourth and fifth digit, and then they did an operation on my ulnar nerve. So I'm laying in bed, recovering, and then it started up on this side. And then it started coming across my hand like this, I said you do not have diabetic neuropathy. And this is within three minutes of meeting him, and he doesn't even know me, and he's got like five of the top neurologists in the world that told me he had diabetic neuropathy, okay? So he's looking at me like, oh, I don't know, you know, yeah. And I said, you want me to prove it to you? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, I had this very powerful vibrating massager, and I put it on his shoulders, and I put it on his neck area. He was laying on his side, and you know, we're backstage with Steely Dan. You know, there's all kinds of famous musicians meandering around. It's almost time for the show. A lot of activity. And we're downstairs in this theater. And then when I put it on, we start, my arm, he's looking up at me. My arm's on fire. My arm, my arm is on fire. He's screaming. And all these people are looking at me like, hey, I'm not, they thought I was like, you know, abusing him, you know? And I was, I shut the machine off quietly and calmly and I said, Mr. Burke, didn't you say you couldn't make a fist before? He said, yes. I said, well, try to make a fist. Oh my God, I can make a fist. I've never been able to do that in a long time. That was because the blood came back into his arm. It was on fire because there wasn't any blood in his arm or a lack of blood for five years. You imagine like the tingling you get when you lay on your arm and then all of a sudden the blood comes back and you're like, oh my God, I hope this crazy tingling goes away quickly. But his came out like a rush and it hadn't been there for so long that it made some intense feeling. So that's what, this is what we have. So in this case, we have the T1 
is the first nerve, C7 is next, and then C6. So this case, these kind of cases, the way they transfer, the numbness goes across the hand like that, so that's how you can get a better diagnosis. The other symptoms are um, neck pain, uh, pain in the traps, shoulder pain underneath the collarbone here, and chest pain, as we mentioned before, headaches at the base of the skull. So she was treated with physical therapy, with planking. Planking is something I don't understand. You know, sustained contraction of a muscle just causes muscle breakdown and inflammation. Inflammation creates um, a, a circuit of, of muscle splinting and it becomes chronic pain. Uh, she was treated with shoulder exercises. Okay, now, you, you've got a, a compressed outlet, okay? So the first thing we know is that her nerve is pinched. Second thing we know is that if the nerve is pinched, since the blood vessels run with the nerve in the bundle, then maybe the vein is pinched. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna do exercises and the heart is strong, it will blast the blood over the obstruction, right? Because there's a pump behind it. But the problem is that the vein doesn't have any pump behind it. So when you push the blood into the arm, it, it doesn't come out as fast. It creates a turbulence here and then a clot forms. So you don't do exercise on a patient that has thoracic outlet syndrome until you've completely removed all the muscle tension that is compressing the outlet. Because if you do, you could end up with a clot and then you're in trouble. Okay, so she was um, also given massages of neck and shoulders, like one of these, okay? Not specific. And the hand cycle, again, big mistake. Never do exercises until the outlet is completely released. And uh, she went to physical therapy one to two times a week. I'm gonna tell you that we have a fast way, which is every day treatment for 10 days, 45 minutes or an hour of power massage in the muscles to get the inflammation out for 45 minutes to an hour in this area, and then 45 minutes of deep tissue on all these muscles for two weeks for every day, that's fast. Then there's even faster, which is when they can come in three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, and three hours in the evening if they're from out of town. She didn't see any, any improvement. Well, of course she didn't, because that's not enough treatment. This, this barely scratches the surface. Plus, if she has bad habits, if she's on the phone a lot, talking to her BFF, and she's streaming videos, I'm just joking, then she's gonna end up with more symptoms are, like she goes and gets like 30 minutes of deep tissue and then she sits and watches TV like this on the couch, wondering why she's not getting better because she only goes twice a week. After four months, she did not get better. So she, then here's what they did also. They did the stretching. So now you're gonna take the scalene muscles which attach on the first rib. You're gonna use a nine to 10, 12 pound bowling ball head to pull on the scalenes and you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna lift the rib up even higher. And the muscle is in a contracted state, swollen with inflammation and damaged. Why would you think that stretching is gonna make it longer or reduce, reduce the pain? It's not gonna work. You, you never ever do stretching of your neck like this because you will end up with this tingling and you're gonna find out you're gonna pinch nerve. So Paget Schroeder, Here's where you get the blood clot because you stretch the neck too much and then you cause the blood clot will form and then you're in trouble. Okay, now here's the symptoms of subclavian vein or effort thrombosis like we had mentioned before where we do a large kind of like sporting event or some hand cycle or what we talked about with band exercise before the outlet is decompressed. The blood can be pushed into the arm with the heart pumping hard but it can't get out because it doesn't have the heart pumping behind it through the vein. And then the arm fills up with blood. You have Urschel sign, which is um, distended, dilated collateral veins and edema, swelling and discomfort, redness, or even purple arm, a purple arm. It's, it's significantly different from the other side. The hand cycle and the exercise, like I said, will cause the could cause a clot formation because the blood is moving through the artery with the heart pumping from the back end, but the vein doesn't have the heart to push the blood across this obstruction and the clot forms right underneath the clavicle here. It'll release into the bloodstream and then 
stroke the opposite side lung called the pulmonary infarct. Um, athletes get that, it's very serious. And uh, so she was given medication for a mechanical condition. What made us think that was going to work? Medications do not work with a, a biomechanical problem, it's mechanical. So she was taking three to four pills before bed, five to six pills, and then sometimes five to six pills before bed. And she was, she, she was, um, if, the, if you're a, a, how do you spell, paralysis? I don't prescribe drugs, wasn't working, so they gave her hydrocortone, and she was given gabapentin for the nerve pain. And um, then they did scalene injections with, um, they did scalene injections with um, cortisone, and um, that was a big mistake, because what had happened was, um, uh, she did the, they did trigger point injections of cortisone into the shoulders, no improvement. The doctor tried facet joint injections. I don't know why he thought that was gonna help because it's a compressive disorder. The facet joints are just the articulations. The doctor also prescribed cortisone injections in the neck. When she got the cortisone injections in the neck, she started throwing up. And then every day she vomited for two weeks every day, Contigu continuously, always throwing up all day long, right after the injections. And then she had nausea for three months until she came to see us, okay? So the doctor injected steroids also into her occipital muscles, little improvement. How are you gonna inject steroids into a muscle that's in a spasm? The spasm is created by the brain. You have to reprogram the brain to shut it off. You can't treat it peripherally. Okay, then they did radio frequency nerve ablations. The problem is they did, did successful radio frequency nerve ablations on C2, 3, 3, 4, 4, and 5. But that's not the area of the problem. The problem is C5 is actually C6, C7, or D1. They couldn't get the ablations in that area. So it was a total, totally unsuccessful, it was a failure. So finally, she went and told the doctor after doing that internet research, you know, where you Google everything, and she said, maybe it's thoracic outlet syndrome, because that's usually how people find out they have thoracic outlet syndrome. They've gone through carpal tunnel syndrome, herniated disc surgery, uh, all their nerve uh, resection, and um, you know, and then finally go, well, you think it could be thoracic outlet syndrome? And all of a sudden, you have a diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome. I did a talk in Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, and a nurse walked up to me and, and she had a scar here, she had a scar there, and a scar here. I said, you just found out you had thoracic outlet syndrome? She goes, yeah. I said, you mean that you got carpal tunnel surgery, ulnar nerve, you know? Yep, I said, I'm sorry, honey, I feel bad for you, but she looked like she was in a war, like she got shrapnel, the surgeries, the scars everywhere through, in her neck, everywhere. And you know what? The problem is the doctor didn't even do AdSense test on her. We talked about it later. She was also a nurse. And so the doctor did AdSense test on her, finally, after she, like, almost, look, I think I have thoracic outlet syndrome, finally did it. Doctor agreed she had thoracic outlet syndrome. So the diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome finally entered her chart. Now, if you have, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome is when you have a compression of the blood vessels and nerves as they pass through three different areas of the tongue. First one is in the scape, where the scalene muscles form a triangle and they attach to the first rib. If they tense up, they can lift the first rib up into the elbow, uh, tunnel. You have a floor of the tunnel and a roof. The floor raises up into the tunnel, okay? That's what most people fo focus on, okay? Now, um, the Baylor Heart and Vascular Hospital, Johns Hopkins and Washington University, the ones that do most of the surgeries, they all agree, number one, is the word compressed. So what's common about their definitions in their website is the word compressed. The only thing that can compress anything in the human body is a muscle spasm or a splinting or muscle tension. 
That's the only thing that can lift bones, shift bones, move bones, or change posture that will cause chronic pain. If you have a Pancos lung tumor, that's different. It's a Pancos lung tumor. It is not thoracic outlet syndrome. Can it be a cause of, of a blockage of the thoracic outlet? Of course. But if you have Pancos lung tumor, you're more concerned about dying than you are about the thoracic outlet syndrome. So these are the 2300 studies. These are the, the different causes of TOS. Muscle contractions, which is number one, okay, bad posture, muscle contractions. Something grows in the outlet like scar tissue or a tumor, okay, anomalies like cervical ribs and elongated bones. And that would be the TPs, but we'll go over that in a second. And trauma, fracture of the rib, what I had, clavicle fracture. Malunion of the clavicle from, uh, the problem is like, here's the problem. Patient is 30 years old. They got this pain here, they woke up with it. They go to the doctor and say, it's not going away. I tried different therapies and he says, well, let's do an x-ray. They take an x-ray and they find out they have an extra rib in their spine, cervical rib. They say, oh my God, look at that. That doesn't belong there and it's horrible, looks terrible and uh, I don't like it. And the doctor says, that's the reason for your thoracic outlet syndrome. You have extra ribs in your spine and at the top. And then you have to say, well, just a minute. I, have, I was symptom free for 30 years, but I was born with those cervical ribs. So what are you really trying to tell me here? How could it be the cervical ribs when I was born with them and I was pain free for 30 years, yet you're gonna operate on my neck and surgically remove them? The way we examine the patients is by palpation. Now here's where patients get really angry about doctors. And that is they say, it hurts right here and right there, okay? And, and I got numbness in my arm. And you say, well, you have numbness, I think we should do an MRI scan, right? Right? Yeah, a lot of patients I will say. You might say that right away, right? Kind of busy. But wait a minute, the patient said, you know, then they go, no, it's right here, doctor, right there. You know what they want you to do? Examine him. Touch it. They want you to go in there and find the pain, track it down, tell you what muscle is, what it does, why it's there, why it could be the source of your pain. You know, they say, well, that's just how doctors do it. No, that's not good doctoring. Okay, now manual muscle testing is where we actually test the muscles because weakness in muscles are, are caused because when the muscle is in a spasm, it's contracted, okay? So if it's already contracted in a spasm, it can't contract anymore because it's already contracted. You got it? The sarcomere is shortened already. It can't get any shorter because it's in a tense, splinted condition. So that's what caused the weakness. When I do deep tissue on athletes, I make them stronger and faster because I lengthen the sarcomere, I allow more force to run through the muscle and they are able to hit the other athlete harder swing the bat faster or do their sport better, okay? And that's just simple math or uh, engineering applied to the human body and understanding what these muscle spasms can do. And so manual muscle testing, if we find weakness in the muscles, then we know there must be some muscular spasms there. Orthopedic tests are done like Adson's test to take the pulse, put the shoulder in various different provocative positions and see if the pulse goes down. The pathological muscle tension on her body was posterior scalene, anterior, and middle. Now, the surgery for scalene, or for thoracic outlet syndrome, is a surgical removal of the anterior and the middle. But the posterior scalene attaches to the second rib. Why isn't that muscle uh, surgically removed? If a person is like this a lot, and the posterior scalene goes into a terrible spasm, it can just as much lift the first rib as the anterior and middle scalene muscles. So because it lifts up the second rib, it takes the first rib with it because they're all connected. So that was where her problem was. The this, this subclavius muscle under the collarbone, not many people look at it, I do. I know how important it is. This muscle actually drops the, uh, it, it, it does two things. Number one, it lifts the first rib up into the outlet, the floor up, and then drops the shoulder down into the outlet. You have a, a roof and a floor. It pulls the floor up 
into the tunnel, drops the roof into the tunnel. And also, this is the pec minor here, attaches to the third, fourth, and fifth rib. When it's in a spasm, it causes pain between the shoulder blades, that nagging pain between the shoulder blades. People work on the back with the body prone, when in fact, the muscle that pulls the ribs out has to be the muscle that has that leverage, and the back muscles can't do that. You have to work on the pec minor muscle from the front to get rid of that pain between the shoulder blades. If you don't, just constantly pushing the bones back in alignment with adjustments uh, isn't going to get long-term improvement. And then you have, they say that this muscle pulls the shoulder down into the outlet. That's called the subpectoral space. Um, sub, uh, so this is where the pinching can occur and they resect this muscle. The problem is the um, uh, subclavius, the coracobrachialis, the muscle that you use to bring your shoulder like this when you're looking at the cell phone. Ladies, hold your purse tight like this with that muscle. And then this muscle that uses the cell phone to hold the cell phone up to your eyes to look at it is the bicep short head. If you hold your cell phone there too long, it'll Muscle breakdown will occur from overuse, and then it'll it get inflamed, it's soaking with inflammation. The nociceptor nerves will pick up on the chemical changes and create that circuit of pain. So you have two areas and two sections of muscles based on two activities that you do too much. You lean to the side like this or back with your 10 pound head dangling from your, your scalene muscles. Like if you, if you, if you move the body to the side like this, the scalene muscles automatically contract to maintain the head perpendicular to gravity and the eyes on the horizon. So if you sit like to, uh, on the right side of the couch while you're watching television for two hours, you'll get a muscle breakdown and spasm of the left scalene. So when patients come to the office, they say, it's on the left side here. I bet you sit on the right side of the couch. I didn't know that because I looked in your bedroom or your living room, I know that because science tells me, you see? And they go, yeah, I do sit on that side of the couch. How did he know that? I got a 50% chance of getting it right. 99.99% .99 of the time I get it right because science tells me. So you have the floor of the tunnel, which is elevated. In her case, she had the t tingling in the nerves here, it, it tingling in the, in the in fourth and fifth digit, which is a pinching of the nerve. As, the, th the tunnel was raising up. Okay, so then um, this is what we talked about before, the writing reflex. When you lean your body to the side, as we know, the, the, the gel material in this, in this semicircular canals rolls with gravity down across the hairs that are inside the, um, inside the uh, semicircular canals, like hula hoops full of hair, slides across it, trips those nerves, and contracts the muscles on the opposite side. That was found by Sir Sherrington, who did the study on animals and found out that this was actually a reflex and not a learned activity. Now, here's the, the different postures that people have. They, if you want to have no tension on the frame, the orientation must be that the bones are stacked up directly on top of each other. So the rule of thumb with patients with neck pain is, you cannot touch your back to the chair. That's your wife, right? That's your wife, right? Yeah, your husband and wife? Yeah. You are sitting correctly, he is not. He's leaning back. He's holding his eight pound head, 10 pound head with his scaling muscles. I'm just like making a comparative. But the rule of thumb is that your back cannot touch the chair because then you're not perpendicular and your neck is tight here, okay? So people say, what do you mean I can't touch a chair? No, you cannot. I don't make the rules. Who, you know, I don't make the rules. This is the laws of gravity. The laws of nature makes the rules. I don't make the rules, they get mad at me, okay? When you carry a bag on the right side, you use your head, you tilt your head to the left to counterbalance the bag on the right. So why does your neck hurt on the left? Because you hold the bag on this side, you drag your shoulder down here, this tenses up the trapezius. No wonder we're all 
a mess up here, you know, with muscle tension, headaches, shoulder pain, pain between our shoulders, we ache everywhere, everything hurts. Because we are manipulating gadgets for 11 and a half hours a day. Nielsen says that the average American is manipulating cell phone or smartphone, iPad, you know, <laughs> gadgets, mechanical things, 11 and a half hours a day. That's really incredible that your, your shoulders can't do that much muscle activity without actually causing damage. It wasn't meant for that. And then sleeping postures. What about the pillow, doctor? I sleep with no pillow. I have too big a pillow, too small. This is too big of a pillow. This is too small. The way you check it is that you take a picture of yourself or look in the mirror to see if your head is level. Now, the pillow will get like weak and then over time it'll drop. Then I tell people, fold up a towel, put it on the bottom part, pop it up a little until you can get to the store and get a new pillow. And then that helps at least stop it. So this is the, the, the tunnel, which is um, the, the roof of the tunnel. Now when the roof of the tunnel drops down, the neck also drops down and then we have this problem with our neck with the pain between our shoulder blades and neck pain. And then this is where it can cause the compression. And this is what causes it. Too much holding of the cell phone. The purse on one side, tilting the head to the other side, holding on to your iPad, and just, just, here's another thing. Women, like if you have a, a study with 500 people getting surgery on the neck for thoracic outlet syndrome, 400 of them will be women. Men have strong necks. We work our necks, we lift things, we, have, we do weight lifting with our neck. With boxers, they, we work their neck hard. I got my guys 50 pounds, they're going like this with their neck, strong. If they get hit in the head, the neck is strong. The head doesn't jerk, they don't have the concussion, the, the, you know what I mean? Aaron, they get knocked out. Um, you know, we work the neck hard, okay? We make it strong. And um, with women, they don't want a thick neck. They don't want to have, a, they want a thin neck, it looks more feminine, looks better. I don't want it like no neck, it looks, doesn't look good. And I don't blame them. But the problem is that it, it's not a good like uh, strategy for long-term neck uh, health. It's not a good strategy. And women can work out with weights. You see, Beautiful women, they're fitness models, and they have these, when they don't flex, they have these beautiful fit bodies, but they lift weights with, the, with their bodies, and they have strong frame, but they don't look bulky. And the old methods, we say, oh, women will look bulky if you do exercise. It's not true. You don't have the testosterone, so you can't get big like men so much. I mean, everyone's different, but for the most part, Women can exercise their neck without having a thick, manly neck. So you should include neck exercises with your routine at the gym. And so um, men don't have it as much because we have stronger necks. Now, this is what we talked about with the Nielsen ratings. Now, incidence has gone up. When I started writing my book, 35,000 people were searching for thoracic outlet syndrome on Google. When the book was completed, it went up to 74,000. And that is because of the cell phone, smartphone. The smartphone is a computer that we hold in our hand every minute of the day. And social media, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, <laughs> my God, LinkedIn, I can't keep track of everything. Some people have three Facebook pages. They have their company Facebook page, their book Facebook page, their personal Facebook page, their Instagram page for personal, their picture of their food, then they have their Instagram for their company to promote their brand, and that is me, okay? And, I don't, and I'm telling you, I am like, what am I doing all day with the Facebook and, and my computer? It's like I have to have three hours to get keep up with everything, and that's how people are these days. So they end up with tension in the muscles of the shoulders and muscle weakness, pathological muscle tension, is when the muscles are, are squeezing too hard. So they injected her scalene muscles with lidocaine to see if it would alleviate the symptoms. Now, if this lidocaine alleviates the symptoms when they inject it in the scalene muscles, they say that the scalene muscle spasms 
are the cause of their symptoms, so we need to surgically remove those. That's the, uh, the, the test. That's not the treatment, that's the test. And if it came out that the lidocaine temporarily uh, reduced the symptoms, then surgical resection of the scalene muscles is a, is a possible uh, solution to the problem. The problem with her was it caused temporary paralysis her arm went completely numb. She couldn't use her arm for three weeks, and she's a nurse. She was paralyzed on one side of her arm from the lidocaine injections. I don't know how that even happened. Then she was offered surgery when, even though the, 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 the lidocaine did not alleviate her symptoms but made her worse, she was operated, uh, offered surgery for that. She declined the surgery. And her doctor admitted that she was his first case of thoracic outlet syndrome. He had never seen one before, and he was gonna like experiment a little, I guess. But this is the way that the surgery is done. Uh, through the armpit transaxillary, they uh, lift the arm up, hold it there for two to three hours while they surgically resect the first rib, the intercostal muscle between the first and second rib, as well as the scalene muscles and they use uh, tools to cut those um, bones out. And or they could do the supraclavicular approach, which is above the collarbone. And if you don't want a scar there, you do the transaxillary. The women don't want scars. But if they have some damage to the vein that needs to be repaired with stint or some kind of um, uh, vascular surgery to the uh, blood vessels or uh, then they'll do this approach because they can get to the blood vessels easier. Now, what muscles are addressed with surgery? The anterior scalene, the middle scalene and the pec minor, and these muscles are also compressing the outlet, but they don't do anything about those. So if you resect the, those three muscles and don't do anything about those, then what's gonna happen? The problem will come back after surgery, I'm sorry because these muscles will compress the outlet. Also, what about the trap spasms? The trapezius muscle is like a suspension spring, like a bungee cord, it bounces. Your shoulders are, can go only so far, like when a bungee cord, you jump, you almost touch the river, and then you bounce back. The shoulder drops down when you tackle somebody, but it almost touches the nerve, and then it bounces back. It's like an extension spring, the trapezius muscles but that's not mentioned here. Okay, so there's nine muscles that contribute to the compression. We said that there were uh, six muscles that drop the shoulder, the roof into the tunnel, but they're only resecting the pec minor. You wonder why the problem comes back. And that is because the, the, sh the muscles that pull the shoulder <laughs> down into the outlet are the coracobrachialis, the bicep short head, the pec minor, and the subclavius muscle. So it's not a complete decompression of the shoulder area where the nerves, the blood vessels and nerves are compressed. Also, success rates of surgery are based upon these four criteria. Number one, excellent results is almost no pain, little to no pain. Now, only two to three percent of patients usually have that, sometimes 10, 15 percent at the high end. So patients go into surgery think you could cut the pain out of their neck. It can't happen, you see? You can't cut muscles out of your neck that balance the tension between, to keep this mass teetering on this, this very delicate torsion spring that has all these complex reflexes and expect long-term that you're gonna have a good outcome because there's muscles are needed. It's like, why are you cutting them out? They're required for maintaining the balance of tension. Now, here's what happened. Now, they say, 3 plus 32 is 35 plus 19, 45, 54 patients had uh, good results means that they had the majority of the symptoms are gone, but still some symptoms. Fair results means the major symptoms are still there after the surgery, okay? So if you think that having the major symptoms still after the surgery is not success, then you have to say that these cases were not successful, only these were successful. So it's more like 50-50. Do doctors expect the patient to be pain-free after surgery? 
Look, I if you got a patient pain free after cutting the first rib out, resecting, excuse me, be more professional, I'm sorry, and resecting the scalene muscles, if you if you can get a patient pain free, you're a genius. I'm telling you. It's you're cutting body parts out of the neck and shoulder area. And to me, it, I just am amazed that they can get even 90% or 80% pain-free with that approach. It's just, it, 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 if they get good results, these surgeons are really good because it shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. It, it shouldn't happen. We went over, mm -hmm. now this is what happened after that. She got Botox injections in the upper trapezius muscles here, the rhomboids on both sides and the scalene muscles and the pec minor on the left. They should never have given her Botox injections on the rhomboid muscles because they need the rhomboids to pull the shoulder up and back. They should have never given her the muscles the injections of Botox in the upper trapezius area because the upper trapezius lift the shoulder or the roof off the tunnel to open it up. So that was a mistake, okay? She felt a little better after the Botox, not much. 80 days later, after the symptoms and signs, after the symptoms, after the Botox wore off, everything, all the pain came back. Okay, so one and a half years after the accident, she still has arm pain, swollen arm and hand. She's got still got the tingling, crushing pain in the chest, severe headaches, facial pain, facial pain, and nausea and vomiting. Okay, the neuro, the neurologist switched her. I told her to change her job, okay? Switched her from uh, Lyrica, or Gabapentin to Lyrica, prescribed her two muscle relaxants, three muscle relaxants, no improvement. Then she decided that because of this chest pain, she'll have her implants removed. That cost her $4,500 to have the breast implants removed, and it had no improvement after the breast implants were removed. This poor girl. Anyway, then she tried physical therapy again. And she was given muscle stim and ultrasound. That didn't work before, so she quit. And then she called me. It was a failure of the supervised physical therapy program. We all know why. She was underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and undertreated. Uh, she had plenty of uh, resources, but the problem is the treatment was not applied properly. Okay, she still had arm and hand tingling, facial pain, nausea, vomiting, and so when she, because she had the trauma, we had to look at these potential sources of pain. Cervical disc injury, uh, a radiculopathy from the brachial plexus, thoracic injuries, as well as spondylosis. But when I palpated her upper body, I found all these muscles were full of inflammation, soaking and hard as a rock and, and, and very painful. So we knew why she was in pain. These muscles here were pulling on her ribs, which caused the chest pain. These muscles were lifting the ribs up, causing the numbness in her hand and arm. So then uh, what, what I did was I actually treated them by doing deep tissue on all those muscles. She came from out of town. So I said, being that you've had this for two years and you're no better, actually worse, let's do five days of treatment. So I set aside five days and I said, we'll do three hours in the morning, th three to four hours in the afternoon, and three hours in the evening of treatment. So she got five days of treatment, a total of 50 hours of work, okay? And here's the exciting part on the very first day while she's talking I looked at her mouth and I noticed her jaw was crooked when she would open her mouth her jaw was crooked and I said okay let me get out my little cell phone put it on slow-mo and I did a video of her occlusion to see what was going on and I found out that she actually had um, a TMJ problem so I put on a glove and I went up with my finger up into the mouth inside and found the pterygoid muscles 
and I pushed on him and pain shot up into her face like this, terrible pain all the way through. And she was squinting and moaning and I said, just wait. And I knew I had it. So I held it there a little longer than normal and then I rolled down to the, a little further into the rest of the pterygoid muscles and after I treated it, she got up and she said, oh my God, she said, I have like this heaviness was for two and a half years is gone. I don't have the nausea anymore. I don't feel like vomiting. It was early in the morning. She would normally be throwing up. I don't have the vomiting anymore. That pain in my face is gone. The very first treatment, okay? So what had happened was when she was hit by the car, her neck was twisted, yes, that's the obvious. But her jaw got twisted too at the same time. And they overlooked that. So the TMJ was actually the source of the, the vomiting and the nausea. If you wanna get rid of all these muscle spasms, you can't use just trigger point therapy. Because when the patient is in pain, their body is stiff. There's not a lot of movement, so the blood flow is not, there's not a lot of blood flow circulation because they're not exercising, they're kind of stiff. So you have all this buildup of lactic acid, so the pH is very low in this area. And so the acetylcholinesterase, they say, doesn't work so well in the acidic environment, as some research papers. So the acetylcholine is constantly overworking the muscles, causing the muscle contractions. Also, sustained muscle contraction because you're in a spasm throws off lactic acid because it's not aerobic, it's anaerobic. And, uh, or no, excuse me, the constant muscle uh, tension, the muscle breaks down, becomes inflamed, the inflammation soaks the tissue, and the nociceptors pick up on that and sends a message to the brain. The brain says, I don't know what to do to fix it, and tightens up the muscle even more. That's the circuit of chronic pain. So what you have to do is you have to flush these lactic acid, these fluids out, and get the lymphatics working again. So I have a powerful massager. It's got a head about this big around, and it's soft. You can put right on your face, your TMJ. You can put it on your, your forehead, your scalp. It feels fantastic. And I use it as a plow, and I push the, the, the blood and the uh, lymph and the and it vibrates rigorously 3200 RPMs and I push it out and vibrates and it feels wonderful and we get the blood flowing through the area get the oxygen to jump into the muscles and shut off the production of lactic acid we move the inflammation away from the nociceptive nerves we go as deep as we can with this tool, and then we try to use our hands. When we're actually using our hands to push the inflammation out of the muscle, the inflammation then goes into a river of blood and moves away faster than if it was, if we just did deep tissue, it would go right back into the muscle again. You understand? You push on the muscle to do deep tissue, it comes out of the muscle, and then it sits there, and it goes right back in the muscle. When we treat it, we sweep to get the blood moving in the area, do the deep tissue, and then we do another application of vibration and massage to move it out of the area so it doesn't seep back in and cause the muscle to splint again. If you are going to do the deep tissue, because you have 10 muscles to work on that are all four inches long, this is the applicator right here, let's say. So I'm doing the pressure like this, and then I overlap a little bit, hold it until the pain goes away, two to three minutes, say two minutes. If you have 10 muscles that are four inches long, that's 40 points times two minutes, that's 80 minutes. Typically, therapist does 30 minutes at the most. They can't get through the whole outlet. That's why this fails, you see? You pass through, you don't even go through it once. And you wonder why after two weeks of treatment, the patient is not any better. That's because the business plan says 45 minutes is all that's the covered, okay? And the treatment plan says 80 minutes is required and she needs 120 because we have to change positions and we have to have time between and, and we have a nurse walk in and so you need 120, but you give them 45, which is inadequate. 
because you're treating patients on the business plan. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a problem on its own. We never had these kind of cases where we got to do 30 hours of treatment to get rid of all this muscle tension that is causing all these problems because we didn't have people on their phone for three, four hours a day manipulating gadgets. They didn't have cell phones in my, my like a middle-aged man, right? But we didn't. The old days we could do like 10 treatments, 30 minutes deep tissue, no problem. Nowadays, 30 hours, okay? And that's why these cases don't get better. So I park over the top of these patients and treat them until we go through all 10 muscles, every single fiber. This is how we get at the pectoralis minor on the side. We roll my thumb across the rib to get the pectoralis minor. I had one football player who was recommended thoracic outlet syndrome surgery. He was the number one quarterback in California, broke all the records. He had a full scholarship, 50,000 a year. He came to me, his father was an MD. They did three tests on him. They found when he lifted his arm up like this, that according to the uh, vascular study that the blood was not flowing through his vein, but when they put it down, it was. That's just because he had a pectoralis minor spasm. They said he had scar tissue in his vein. What do you have, x-ray vision? I said to his dad, how do they know that? He goes, yeah, I know. What do you think? They guessed, oh my God, I'm so angry. So he was mad. So I did six hours of deep tissue on his pectoralis minor muscle in one day, and the problem was gone. And you know what, I got an email from him. He tried out for the uh, National Football League. He's feeling great, he's not had the problem come back. Now we have to restore the joint play. The problem with the elevation of the first rib is that the scaling mu muscles lifted up. We can relax them, but like if we have a kid whose shoulders are like this, we can work the, work the back muscles and we can shift the bones position by improving the resting tone of the muscle by training with weights, okay? The problem is you cannot train the muscle to drop the rib down. So you must manipulate it. When I manipulate the first rib, I can hear this loud audible uh, adjustment and you can feel the rib actually move down out of the outlet physically. And this is how we fix the TMJ problem. Open the mouth, go up inside the TMJ with the finger, with a glove, and do deep tissue on the, t on the uh, t internal pterygoids. You can see how it would come through inside both on, underneath here by the jaw this way, actually here, and inside the pterygoid to fix the jaw. And then th this is, um, then you do the training. When she left our facility, she was almost completely pain-free except for a little bit of facial pain, but her symptoms were relieved in five days. And last time I talked to her, she's doing great. So that's my case history. I hope you liked it. Does anyone have any questions? Questions? Okay, thank you very much.